um, when we were doing this uh, program, designing this program, uh, I was thinking about, you know, who brings passion to their work and, and who has innovation at the heart and who has education in his heart. And Ed was like the perfect logical fit of all of this. And so uh, we're really, really pleased to welcome Ed here today. What I'd love to hear from him is, is how he connects the dots between what excites him uh, about education and about innovation. How does he use that in his work to, to stimulate new ideas and to get people excited about things? So my pleasure to introduce my friend and fellow alumni, Ed Mansour. Thank Ed, you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Larry. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, good. Good, uh, good afternoon. You all hear me okay? Thank you. I'm, I'm really, truly honored to be here. Larry, thank you for inviting me to, to this. And uh, I always love coming back to Penn State. Um, I had a wonderful experience here as a student uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, so I, I have to be honest that um, this is sort of new to me, this sort of style of presentation. Uh, I've ran an educational software company for about 16, 17 years, so the majority of talks I give, I'm trying to sell people on an idea or a program that I've developed, giving some sort of a technical demonstration. So uh, I'm going to try to slip into more of a conversational mode. And um, Larry had contacted me, as he mentioned, uh, about a month or so ago, and uh, paid me a very uh, nice compliment. He said, Ed, ever since I've known you, you've seemed to be passionate about what you do. And I'd like to invite you to talk to our group about uh, you know, how you use that passion to spark some of the things that you develop as an entrepreneur. Uh, and I said, sure, that, that sounds like it'd be fun. Um, but uh, as I've gone through and sort of planned exactly what I would talk about, uh, more and more I realized that I was probably just going to get up and sort of, you know, just tell you a little bit about my story and um, then let the dialogue go from there. So um, I have, um, since I was, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the beginning and I'll sort of tell you um, what I've done and what I'm doing now. And along the way, hopefully you'll get a chance to understand um, you know, some of the decisions that I made that I, I hopefully were driven by what really interests and excites me and that I'm very passionate about. Um, for whatever reason, probably a lot of, some kids grow up and they want to be professional football players. Uh, they want to be astronauts. For whatever reason, from the age of six years old, I wanted to be a weatherman. That was just my thing. Um, if you talk to any people that, and I actually have a, in this little slideshow that I put together, I actually have a clip uh, of a picture of a newspaper article when I was a little kid uh, being interviewed about, you know, how I'm the school's weatherman, all right? So um, uh, I, it could have been because I grew up in upstate New York in the snow belts where you would sometimes, uh, you know, go to sleep at night and there'd be no snow on the ground and you'd wake up and there'd be 24 inches of snow and sometimes they wouldn't even cancel school. Uh, so I think just, you know, being around that, I, I think for whatever reason, just really triggered this deep-seated, um, it might be not, it might not be inappropriate to call it an obsession. I literally was obsessed with weather. Um, I would bring a weather radio to school, you know the NOAA weather radios that you turn on and they 24 hour day weather? I would bring one to school with me. Um, I would uh, tell the teachers that I, was, I had to go to the bathroom and I would go into the coat closet and listen to the weather radio. Um, you know, God, God forbid anything came in between me and seeing one of my favorite TV weather forecasters, you know, whether it be at 6.45 in the morning or uh, at night during the evening news, it, it was just my thing. I, I knew that I wanted to go to Penn State when I was very young. Penn State, I don't know if the statistic still holds, but at one point, one out of four working meteorologists in the United States were Penn State alumni. So, you know, I had been aware of that. I grew up in upstate New York about two and a half hours from Penn State. So it was just, there wasn't even a consideration about it. I was going to do whatever I had to do to get accepted to Penn State, and I was going to enroll in the Penn State Meteorology Department. And I indeed ended up doing that. Um, and uh, that, so weather for me has just been the one constant that has always been in my life. And people have asked me, well, why do you like weather so much? And I just, sometimes I don't really have that much of an answer. It's just, it's just something that is always, you know, if I stop to think about it, Maybe I would talk myself out of it. Maybe I would come up with reasons like, you know, well, you know, at the end of the day, um, no one really knows what the weather's going to be, but um, it's, just, it's just my thing. You know, it's just always been my thing. And um, uh, I, I think um, I, I actually 
kind of sometimes was always curious about a lot of the people that I would meet in college and when I would, you know, they wouldn't know what they're going to major in. Um, they're undecided. It's like, well, what are, you, what are you interested in? So to me, that was sort of, um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a, uh, can you all hear that? There's some, uh, um, if, uh, I, I can talk over it as long as it doesn't bother you guys. Okay. All right. So um, anyway, um, you know, that, so it, it was sort of kind of interesting for me to, to you know, for, for there to be people that didn't know what they wanted to do. I never had that problem. Uh, and I felt lucky. I felt blessed by that. So uh, just to talk a little bit about, um, you know, to follow up with how Larry mentioned how we met. Um, so I graduated from, uh, while I was at Penn State, um, I decided to take on a second major. Um, I, not everyone gets to go on to be Jim Cantori and to be a you know, nationally recognized weather person. And, and the, some of the jobs in uh, meteorology, at least at the time, you know, were few and far between. They're not very high paying. So I decided to pick up a second major. I wanted to complement meteorology with something else. So Penn State had just started this program called geoenvironmental engineering. I think it's since changed to energy engineering. And I was one of the first of a couple of people that graduated with a degree in geoenvironmental engineering in addition to meteorology from Penn State. So when I graduated from Penn State, I actually got a job um, in an environmental engineering consulting firm. And they did air pollution inventories. So it was kind of cool because having knowledge of how pollution gets created um, with an engineering background and then having knowledge about what's going to happen once it gets out into the atmosphere from a meteorology background, it was kind of cool to combine the two. But it wasn't close enough to weather, and I eventually started to hate it. Um, so I, I, I quit, and I um, had applied to some graduate schools. So I um, went to pursue a master's degree in meteorology at Florida State University in Tallahassee. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers, the, the, I used to love snow. Growing up in upstate New York, I used to ski, I used to play hockey, all that stuff. So for me, I always thought I would want to live in a climate like Maine or Vermont. But then the winter of 1993-94 happened, <laughs> which um, I don't know, I, I think, I can't swear on this, but I think that the state college area, I think, won the snow title for east of the Mississippi. I think that winter, I think we had more snow here than a lot of the places that you would usually think of, like Syracuse or Oswego, New York. Um, so for, I went from wanting to live in a very cold climate to not caring if I ever saw snow again in my life. Um, and so the, the graduate schools I applied to were, as you would expect, in like Florida State, Texas A&M, University of Arizona. And I ended up going to Florida State University, which is in Tallahassee, the capital of Florida, a uh, nice place with a nice climate, uh, to pursue a degree in meteorology. And um, another thing, um, I, I think I might have a slide to show um, real quick. And I, um, let's see here. I'm going to skip around in these slides. Th these slides are very, um, not very uh, exciting, but there's a, one slide I want to um, add to my story here. Um, where's my tech guy? Okay, okay. All right, let me, uh, um, is there a delay on these? Uh, I'm trying to scroll to a particular slide. There we go. Okay, I want to tell a little story. There, there's, um, see that? There, there's a picture of the uh, that geeky looking kid there. Um, I think I was in fourth or fifth grade there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but um, I want to tell, Larry mentioned the name of my company is uh, called U Compass. And I want to tell a little bit of a story about how that got started. So um, I kind of joke around that. Uh, um, I wrote the book on Penn State, okay, which is not entirely untrue. So when I was a uh, senior at Penn State, uh, I sort of felt that I had done just about everything I could do at Penn State. I, was, um, uh, I got two degrees. I played a sport for a couple of years. I played on the lacrosse team for a couple of years. Um, and I was, you know, winding down my career at Penn State. And I sort of said, boy, I've, I've really learned a lot. I wish I could do something with all this information. Um, boy, I should write a book about that, this place. And I said, I'm going to write a book about this place. So I actually came up with an idea for a publication that could be geared toward incoming freshmen and their parents. And it was sort of a compendium 
of a lot of the different things that I had learned as a student at Penn State. As far as just, you know, things like uh, things to consider when you're looking to choose a major, uh, places to study, like did you know that, you know, a lot of people go to the diner that's open 24 hours a day to drink coffee and study until all hours of the night. I'm sure some of the alumni in here can uh, re relate to that. So anyway, I put together this book, had it printed, and I sold it to the Penn State bookstore that they used in conjunction with their freshman orientation program. So... Um, the, the project from a business perspective wasn't really, I didn't make a lot of money, but it was very successful from an operational perspective. And I had sort of gotten bit by, at that point in time, a little bit of an entrepreneurial bug. Um, I sort of recognized that I had, you know, um, something inside me that, you know, wanted to be creative and wanted to create. So um, originally, what th so then I took the, this book, this concept, and took it to West Virginia University and did the same thing there and created the West Virginia University Compass. Um, then I tried to do the same thing at another university, Virginia Tech, and got shot down and I was devastated. Okay? And that's one of the lessons that I learned is uh, just sort of you know, skipping around on different topics is uh, I think that um, when you try to do things, for me, I think the failures that I've had are more important and more meaningful to me than the successes that I've had. Um, so I, I try to be very self-reflective when something doesn't go as I would have wanted it to. I try to really put a lot of thought into, was there something that I could have done better? Was just that just how it was meant to be? So when I went to graduate school at Florida State, I had already sort of been bit by this entrepreneurial bug. And I knew that at some point in time, I would want to do something entrepreneurial. So, quick story, uh, the very first day, so when I was, uh, my, the first day of graduate school orientation at Florida State, um, I was sitting amongst the other new graduate students, and the head of the department said, uh, hey, we need some teachers to teach the introductory meteorology course, which, are any of you familiar with Meteo 2 at Penn State? Is that, it's like, it's like meteorology for non-meteorology majors. It's like a science general elective. So uh, I said, well, do you pay for this? Um, and they said, well, yeah, you would get paid. You would get a teaching assistantship. So I'm looking around. No one's raising their hand. I'm like, sure, I'll do it. You know, how, that, this, this could be kind of cool. So um, the very first day, at, so, you know, my first day of graduate school, um, I was thrown into a classroom of about 180 kids um, with no syllabus, no book, um, here you go, these kids are taking three, a three-credit course in introductory meteorology. So um, I said, okay, well, how am I gonna, how am I gonna deal with this? So um, a lot of the work that I had been doing up to that point in time, I had been introduced to computer programming. And actually my research in graduate school was very programming intensive. So I was um, writing computer code, internet-based code to pull terabytes worth of data off of a weather satellite and analyze it and do research on it. So um, I, I just, for whatever reason, I had this light bulb went off in my head that I was going to use some of those newfound skills I was developing to teach to, for this new responsibility I had to be a teacher. So I ended up writing a software program to teach my course. So it wasn't just a course that you could use to teach meteorology, it was a course you could use to teach anything. Um, and much to the chagrin of my major professor in graduate school, I ended up getting a lot more, to use the word Larry instructed me to focus on passion, I ended up getting a lot more passionate about how to use this incredible new medium, the internet, to teach. I ended up getting more passionate about that than what I was supposed to be researching in graduate school as a meteorologist. Um, so. You know, most of my time from that point on in graduate school, instead of being spent on research that I was supposed to be working on, it was spent screwing around with this computer software to try to make it work better to teach students. Um, so I ended up limping across the finish line with my master's degree. Um, and, um, you know, when it came time to decide if I was going to go on to get a PhD, I sort of looked in the mirror and said, you know, I don't really want to be in school for another four or five more years. I've, I really love this idea of building a computer software to teach, and um, I think that's what I'm going to do. So I started a company called UCompass, and this was in 19, this was late 1998, probably very shortly before I met Dr. Reagan. 
And uh, for the last 16, 17 years of my career, I've been continuing to evolve and build that educational software. You're all familiar with Blackboard? Programs like Blackboard? The program that I wrote is like Blackboard, but it's um, a bit more K through 12 focused. Uh, and um, the, uh, the U in U Compass actually stands for university, because originally we thought most of our work would be in higher education, but since then it's sort of gone more, into, more and more into K through 12 education. Um, so anyway, um, that's, uh, um, and, and when I, I did not take the easy way um, as far as starting a business. Um, this was, I started my business around the beginning of the dot-com boom, when um, people were throwing venture capital at anyone with, you know, two brain cells to rub together. Um, and I just, you know, that concept didn't really make a lot of sense to me. I had an idea, I had a vision, and I was going to be darned if I wasn't going to see that vision become uh, a, a reality. So um, someone asked me, I remember this very, um, you know, industrious looking gentleman with a nice business suit on. Um, he had been a worldwide vice president of IBM in Tallahassee. And uh, he, he, he did sort of like tried to help provide, he was a motivator for, uh, you know, young entrepreneurs. And he asked me, he said, oh, okay, so what's your business plan? Uh, do, do you have your business plan? Can I take a look at it? I said, business plan? I, I really don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, you need a business plan. So I sort of, you know, looked him in the eye and with a straight face said, well, work my, work my blank off and hope for the best. And that was really what my business plan was. And, and ever since then, that kind of has always been, been my business plan and sort of the philosophy is just, you know, work, work hard and, you know, really, you know, try to position yourself for the best. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, as far as how does passion fit into that, well, you know, I think along the way to, um, you know, following your dreams and pursuing what you want to accomplish, you're going to hit a lot of stumbling blocks. You're going to have a lot of fear. You're going to have a lot of um, self-doubt. You're going to have a lot of disappointment. Um, and, and I think for me, I, I think, you know, quote, success, I don't think it's the absence of those things. I think it's the persistence in spite of them. I think it's just, you know, sort of just accepting that you're going to get kicked in the teeth um, and you're going to just, you know, keep going. And I think it's, um, uh, you know, the, more, the, uh, the persistent monkey is more likely to survive than the strong monkey. And I sort of think of myself as a pretty persistent monkey. Um, so um, anyway, that's, um, so, um, you know, long story uh, made as short as I can. So that, that's sort of what I've been doing for the past 16 years or so, is um, managing this company that built this educational software that I made while I was, you know, screwing around with it as a graduate student. I'm very proud of the fact that since that time, the software has served well over 3 million students across the United States and, and many tens of thousands of faculty. It's used as the, um, there, there's a program in Florida, the state of Florida, called the Florida Virtual School which is a very innovative uh, invention of the state of Florida. In Florida, uh, the Florida Virtual School is the only state-funded, statewide virtual high school in the country. So the way it works is if you're, let's suppose you're a student in Tampa and you want to take something like AP Chemistry, but your high school doesn't have AP Chemistry. Well, you can go to your guidance counselor and he or she can put you in the Florida Virtual School for free and you can take it online through this digital learning and teaching platform from a teacher that's maybe in Jacksonville. So um, for the last 12, 13 years, if you've taken a course, if you've taught a course from that Florida Virtual School in the state of Florida, you've used that software that I wrote and manage. Um, so that's what I've been doing for my day job over the last uh, 15, 16 years. But a few, few years ago, I realized that I was just for some reason, oh, and just real quick before I get into that, I want to brag a little bit about some of the innovations that we've come up with in, in that time period. And more than bragging, I want to sort of explain to them how the innovation was sort of inspired by the, the instinct for survival. Okay, One of my favorite ones, and, and I apologize for not having more I didn't know what the format was going to be if I would do, you know, I didn't want to make this a demonstration because I tend to get pretty long-winded when I give a demonstration. I tend to say, look at this, look at that, look at that, because I like showing people things versus talking about it. So I'm going to just talk you through this. Um, so one of the things I'm very proud of is that my company, we, we were the first people to ever uh, use a digital, a wireless device 
in the online learning landscape. Okay? How many of you, a lot of you are, I can tell, are, are young enough where you might not even know what I'm talking about when I say Palm Pilot? Does everyone know what a Palm Pilot? So when I started, as I mentioned, I started my business on a shoestring. Um, I was working, you know, during the first year I, I had, I was working as a teacher at Florida State in the graduate program. I was an online news editor for the local newspaper. I developed websites for a local advertising agency. Anything I could do to get together the money to start a business, to buy a server, to get an accountant, to do those sorts of things. So um, I, I was blessed or cursed with the ability, or, the ability to not sleep a lot or the ability, inability to sleep a lot, whichever you, whichever you choose. Um, so uh, anyway, um, the first, you know, so my first real customer was the Texas Education Agency, okay, which is a big organization. And um, they didn't know that I was a one-man show. They didn't know that, you know, how fragile, um, you know, my company was just having been started out. So, you know, it, it's very simple. Uh, you know, I, I had to find a way to provide the support that they would need. Otherwise, you know, I would not have the opportunity to have them as a customer. So the Palm 7, Okay, if any of you remember, the Palm 7 was really the world's first internet-connected handheld, all right? Um, and the way it worked was it was a Palm Pilot with a little antenna on it, all right? And they sold a subscription service to, to what was called the Palm Network that used infrastructure from what was then Bell South. All right, so the way it would work was, you know, you have this handheld that could connect to the internet. So I literally was drooling about that. And I was in the CompUSA parking lot when the truck came to deliver it, okay? So what I did over the course of a frenetic weekend is I took our entire learning management system and transcribed it onto this Palm 7 device. And the reason I did that is so that, because at the time I didn't have the money to hire a bunch of support techs, so I built a system so that I could provide technical support to those customers if I was at a movie theater, if I was at a restaurant, if I was out for a walk. So, um, you know, what then happened was is people started talking about what we had done. We had created a learning management system that you could learn or teach wherever you happen to be. So a lot of people were saying that, you know, this was really innovative and this was really groundbreaking. But what was interesting for me, from my perspective, is, you know, I, I, that was an example of being innovative, you know, indeliberately innovative, if that would be the right, right way to say it. In other words, um, I had to find a way to do something to be able to survive and, you know, um, create an opportunity. So a lot of the stories we have, you know, that, that I've been involved with have been similar to that. In other words, being pushed to, um, you know, come up with a solution for something. It's sort of, you know, with stress, you have fight. You've heard of fight or flight. Well, one that you don't hear people talk about a lot is adapt. Okay, so you have fight. You can fight what your stress is. You can run away from it. But you can also sort of say, hmm, how am I going to adapt to this? And I think it's in that adaptation that oftentimes some light bulbs for innovation can, can take shape. All right. So um, anyway, does that give a brief history and time? Do you have sort of a, from what I described, do you kind of get an understanding of what my life has been like the last 15 years running an educational software? company. All right, very good. Um, and there, there were some other cool things we did along the way. Um, we were the first to ever implement podcasting into a learning management system. Um, we implemented something called location-based learning, which is, you know, taking advantage of a GPS capability of a mobile device to deliver information about a learning artifact that you happen to be in close proximity to. One of the things that I can tell you that I'm very guilty of is often, um, you know, creating problems that are looking for solutions, okay? Um, or solutions, I should say, solutions looking for problems. Um, so, but sometimes you, you create opportunities by, by doing that. Because for instance, you know, that wireless, the, the name of our, the learning management system I wrote is called Educator. And the wireless component of it is called Wireless Educator. So I remember when we were first promoting it at a trade show, trade show called Educause, which is like the big higher education technology trade show, uh, we had a booth and a lot of people were interested in what we were doing, but they had no use for it. 
But they said, oh, well, these guys seem like they're pretty innovative. And by, by them seeing what we had done, they were able to learn about our core program that they actually did need, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so um, now uh, I'm going to um, progress into what I'm doing now. Okay. What, I, what I'm doing now, and you can see I'm wearing a shirt called WeatherStem. Okay, that's the, one of my later initiatives that I've just launched uh, a couple of, uh, about a year and a half ago. So um, a few years ago, I started getting a little depressed um, because, uh, you know, a learning, you, do you all know what a learning, I'm, I'm, don't have a good sense of the diversity of the audience as far as, you know, how, you know so there might be people in here that don't know what I'm talking about when I say LMS, but there might be a lot of people that do. I can assume that people know what an LMS is. So an LMS, I, I would challenge you to find a software system that could potentially have more that it offers than an LMS. Um, you know, LMSs, especially in K through 12, they want things that keep track of things like recess and school bus routes and, and everything under the sun. So um, I started missing the work I've been doing. You know, I started missing weather. Okay, I felt a need to bring weather back into my, into my life somehow. So one of the things that I have also done for the last 10, 11 years is um, I have a weather station in my backyard, all right? So um, I, you know, have this weather station that measures temperature and humidity, um, pressure. I have all these other components that measure things like soil moisture. Uh, I have probes that measure the temperature of my pool, the temperature of my spa. Um, I, I, my wife would call it more of an, obs again, more of an obsession than a hobby. So that's just sort of been my thing, is, is I have this weather station in my backyard that has sort of been a hobby that's evolved into something. Um, and then also another thing, so I'm going to sort of tell a couple different stories that all weave into one that will help you understand what I'm doing with weather stem now. Um, and... Uh, so that's one aspect of it, is I've been building and managing my own backyard weather station. Another part of this is um, I, have a, uh, I have a seven-year-old little boy, okay? My, um, I actually have three children. I have a seven-year-old son, and I have um, five-year-old boy-girl twins, all of whom happen to share the same birthday, uh, June 12th, okay? It just worked out that way. So my seven-year-old son, Max, uh, is autistic, okay? He has autism. And if you've ever been around an autistic child, a lot of them are very, very into routine, okay? They, they're into doing things the same thing all the time. So I live about a half a mile away from the elementary school that he goes to, all right? So um, I, he, one of the things we do, one of our traditions is we walk to school. We walk to school in the morning, we walk to school in the afternoon. As a matter of fact, one of the hardest things about being on trips like this for probably both of us, is that I'm not there to walk him to school this morning and I'm not going to be there to walk him home this afternoon, okay? That's, by, for me, by far and away the hardest thing about, you know, who cares about being in cold weather or flight delays? That, that, that's, for me, the hardest thing. Um, so anyway, um, we would uh, walk to school and there were many mornings where I would totally screw up how he should be dressed, okay? Um, you know, there, there was one morning in particular, I just looked down on him and he was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and it was about 50 degrees and raining. And I thought, well, what is wrong with this picture? I have an advanced degree in meteorology. I have a weather station in my backyard and I can't figure out how to dress my son. This is, you know, something's wrong. So that night I went home and I probably wrote one of the most useful computer programs that I've ever written. And it was only three lines. Okay, I wrote a program that every morning at 7 a.m., it sends me a text message. And it tells me this is the current temperature, this is what the high is going to be, and this is how much, if any, rain we're going to get today. So perfect. I know how, so I would, you know, getting him dressed, I'd bring that information into his closet with me, and I know how to dress him now. I know how he needs to be dressed for later, and I know if we need an umbrella or not. Okay, so that was, that was perfect. So then I took that information and I said, I wonder if other people can benefit from this. You know, certainly other people, you know, walk to school and they mess up how they should dress. So I created a Twitter page and had the information update that Twitter page. And, you know, told a few people about it. And all of a sudden I see there's all these people following this Twitter page. So I said, wow, there, there's got to be something here. 
Um, so then I went one step further and I created a Facebook page for it and I added some other information. I would post things like every night at midnight it would post how much rain we had that day, what the high temperature was, what the low temperature was. And then all of a sudden there's like hundreds of people following this Facebook page. So then I'm starting to really kind of see if there are any dots that be, can be connected here. Meanwhile, I told you about the work that I've been doing in the state of Florida, responsible for the state's K through 12 digital learning and teaching platform. And in Florida, this is gonna probably, uh, um, no disrespect to the state I live in now, but there was something that really troubled me that I learned about, is now, did you know in Florida, twice as many people die of lightning than all 49 other states combined? Yes, that's true. There's twice as many people get killed by lightning than all the whole other country combined. Um, also, you know, agriculture is huge in Florida, and of course, weather is extremely important for agriculture. Um, you know, we have a lot of people are worried about coastal sea level rise in Florida, understandably, uh, forest fires, uh, pest infestation, all sorts of things that would, you would think that weather would be really, really important. So I was very surprised that the state of Florida doesn't have a course in weather for middle school or high school students. They don't have a course in climate. In all of the curriculum in K through 12, they only have a little bit of coverage of weather. Um, Georgia has a whole course that you can take in weather, whole year-long course, as do many other states. So, um, you know, I, I, one of the things that we wanted, I wanted to do was set out to endeavor to change that. So then I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about this weather station, I'm thinking about my 15 year experience writing educational software, and we, I created this program called Weather STEM, okay? And actually that's one of the things that I'm doing up here at Penn State, um, is uh, you know, how, how many of you have stumbled across online the weather STEM system that's on the Penn State campus, okay? A couple, couple people. There's actually a system over at the, um, Arboretum, the Penn State Arboretum, and there's an event going on there today because today happens to be Arbor Day, okay? So anyway, um, I'll tell you a little about, about what weather STEM is and then um, explain a little bit the implementation details. So uh, what, a, what, we've, what I've come up with is this idea that's called a weather STEM unit, and that's actually what's installed here on the Penn State campus, and it's three different things. It is a weather station that measures temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, barometric pressure, um, rainfall, uh, and it is an agricultural monitoring system that measures things like soil moisture, soil temperature, condensation, and it's also a cloud camera. So we actually have a waterproof camera that is connected to the Arboretum building, and once a minute, it takes a picture of the skies overhead, okay? So all of that data is tied together in this science education platform that we built called Weather STEM. And the STEM and Weather STEM, do you all know what the acronym STEM stands for? Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Well, in Weather STEM, because agriculture is such an important component of it, the STEM also implies like the stem of a plant because there's a very big agricultural focus and emphasis on it. So um, this system basically just collects data all day long, all night long, and uploads it into a platform where, and the vision is, let me, let me ask a question. Um, how many, you're all Penn State fans, I'm sure, a lot of you uh, anyway. Would you rather watch Penn State play a live football game over in Beaver Stadium, or would you rather I give you a DVD of a game that was played maybe 10 years ago? Live, right, yeah. So uh, the vision that I have is why don't we try to introduce that more into our science education efforts? Why don't we try to find ways to let teachers have a tool that can let kids see data as it's happening and use that in a meaningful way to prompt you know, rich STEM education conversations, all right? So um, right now, um, this project that I've started, what I'm doing in Florida, and I I've got some exciting news about Pennsylvania. So um, I've set aside a, you know, I've, fortunately, I've, I've, you know, I guess I've worked very hard to, to build a successful software business, and I have the resources available where I've been able to set aside a chunk of money where the, the system that I described, this weather STEM unit, we're in the process of donating one to a school in each of Florida's 67 counties. Um, and uh, that's expensive and very ar arduous. 
And um, I, I remember having a conversation with someone that was saying, well, how is this going to make money? Um, and I said, well, you know, to be honest with you, I really don't know. Um, well, aren't you concerned about that? And I said, well, yeah, sure. But um, I really love it. You know, I, I, I feel that, you know, and, and so what? So if it doesn't make any money, I'm not spending every dime that I have on it. And I'm really enjoying it. And the worst thing that's going to happen is we're going to have exposed a lot of kids and a lot of people to some pretty interesting concepts and some pretty important concepts and pretty important topics. So, you know, as, as far as um, uh, the, uh, the, the slides and the thesis that I was going to be trying to stick to, one of them was, um, you know, sort of related to like, you know, how, how are passion and money related? Uh, you know, for me, I, I think that um, I, I would rather die poor and interested than rich and bored. That's just me. Um, I'd like to die rich and um, interested, <laughs> certainly, of course. But, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, for me, w w one of the things like early on, you know, when, when you like near the beginning of the dot-com boom, a lot of entrepreneurs that I talked to were just very focused on the return. You know, I want to build something and sell it. Um, and, oh, you know, I want to get a big buyout. Um, and, and it just, for, for whatever reason, I'm not knocking that. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to make money. But for me, it just, it felt like if that was my main motivation, it just felt like I knew that it was never going to become, you know, something that I, you know, really was going to be able to put the energy and intensity into. So that, that, that's one thing that I, I sort of really, really learned um, uh, along the way. And, and uh, one, one story I can tell, because, uh, you know, Larry, I, I understand that Penn State has a very entrepreneurial framework right now. Um, I, I, as one of the things to follow up on what Pres um, Larry said before, um, when I was probably one of the few people in Tallahassee, where Florida State is, that saw President Barron's departure with any sort of silver lining. Okay, he was a wonderful president there. He instituted a lot of great programs. And one of them was this concept of uh, Florida State becoming an entrepreneurial university. And, and I think that, um, you know, with respect to uh, entrepreneurism, a, a quick story I'll tell. I, I just remember when I was um, starting uh, m my business, there was this young man that I knew that was also a Penn State graduate. And he had went and raised a bunch of venture capital. And um, I saw him at this trade show, and he had this big fancy booth, and I remember seeing him after the show, and he was getting into a limo with some of his friends, okay? They were going, who knows what they were going to do. He's like, oh, Ed, come on. I'm like, no, no, I had a long day. I, I got to get in my, uh, you know, I, I got to take the shuttle bus to the hotel way, way, way down. It's probably $40 a night. Um, so um, anyway, a couple of years later, what was interesting was at that same conference, um, you know, I had a booth and he came and handed me his resume because he was looking for a job. So, um, you know, I, I just think that um, there, there was a lot, of, a, a lot going on when you saw a lot of people getting money thrown at them and a lot of people getting started with entrepreneurship. And you could really tell that the main motivating factor there was, was money. And like I said, I'm not knocking that. But, you know, I just think that, you know, um, at some level there's got to be something more. There's got to be something that sort of drives you, that, that pulls you, that compels you, that makes you endure all the kicking in the teeth that you're going to get exposed to. And for me, like I said, as I'm telling you my story, you know, weather has or always sort of been that, that constant. Um, so anyway, this project that I'm working on right now um, is, uh, you know, very uh, um, scary, you know, because putting a tremendous amount of resources forward. Um, but it's, it's wonderful. You know, it, I'm able to blend together my lifelong passion for weather with the career I've had in educational software for the last 15, 16 years. And we're going to be doing the same thing in um, Pennsylvania next year. And actually, yesterday, we introduced the same program that we introduced up at the Penn State Arboretum last fall. We introduced it to one of the local state college area schools. Um, Park Forest Elementary School, which is just off, just off Atherton, um, I guess, uh, after the, the giant uh, uh, grocery store. So um, anyway, um, I am going to just sort of try to um, flip through some of these slides to see if there's uh, 
anything that, um, and I, like I said, I obviously didn't, script, didn't stick to my script, but that was sort of kind of by design, to be honest with you. Um, let me just, uh, it's very, and I apologize, I'm, I'm clicking, I'm clicking and it's going very slow, so just, uh, okay, so I've, I've talked about a lot of these things, Ed Talks, Entrepreneurial Success. Um, Ed, Ed, while you're yes. doing that, yeah, can I introduce a question? Yeah, throw me a lifeline. So, so um, uh, you know, I, I, I think the way you have encompassed this passion for weather, starting very early on, uh, into a really a career in a, in a path of your life. Um, now, with your family, you've got kids in the house and everything else to deal with. How do you find the, um, the balance of this working between you know, the, the drive and the energy you have to put into the business side of it, but also your responsibilities for home and family. And Well, sure, and, and that, that's an excellent question. And, and I, I will say that, you know, for me, I don't know, I, I don't know the answer is, if I had to start my business, at, you know, as a family man, I don't know if I would have been able to do it. I just am being honest. You know, maybe I would have, maybe I wouldn't, but, but I just don't know. I think something would have had to give. Either I would have not been able to put the work in to get the business off the ground, or I would have been a crappy father, uh, you know, or both. Um, so, you know, I, I do think balance is, is really hard. And one of the things I struggle with personally is, you know, monitoring and keeping a check on that balance. Um, because, uh, you know, for me, um, I, I, I've tried to find a number of one, of, one of the things that happens with me sometimes is truly sometimes passion gets a little out of control with me. Um, and, and I think um, one of the things that I don't like, uh, not that I'm trying to make you all be my psychologists and I'm up here on a couch, but um, you know, one of the things that is uh, you know, um, challenging for me sometimes is I tend to be a very extreme person. There tends to not be a lot of gray area for me. I tend to either be black or white with things. Either I want to do something full bore, 100 miles an hour, or I really have no use for it. Uh, so one example, one, one of my outlets a few years ago that I, I pursued for quite a long time was, was music. Um, you know, I love classical music, and I started, um, play, I started taking classical piano lessons. And, uh, you know, it, very, it, it became very clear early on that this was something that I had to, you know, become proficient at. And before you know it, it was, you know, sort of, ha had sort of become a little bit of an obsession. So it was like... I needed an escape from what was supposed to be an escape in the first place, okay? So, so that's something that um, I, I've um, tried to, to balance. What, what I try to do, you know, I'm, I'm a very analytical person. I'm a very quantitative person. So what I try to do when I'm home is I try to have like a, a scoring system where I'm trying to earn an A every day. And like, um, you know, um, I, I can only earn a maximum of 10 points, so like nine, or 10 is an A, 8 is a B, 6 is a C, 7 is a C, etc. So, you know, I, I get like three points for spending three hours with the kids. And I get like three points for spending like six hours on work. And I get like, you know, one point for spending, you know, time with the family. So I, 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 tr I, I have to go out of my way to make sure that I'm balancing, you know, all those things that are very important. And, and I think if you don't do that, eventually things are going to start to break down. So, you know, balance is, is you know, it's a very good question. Balance is, is really important. And, and it can be when you're, you know, when you're, uh, for me sometimes, like, and another thing I'll talk about with passion is um, passion for me is a very mysterious entity. Where does it come from? You know, how do you get it back when it goes away? Um, what put it there in the first place? Um, you know, when I'm like passionate, like for instance, in most of 2014, um, I was sort of writing this weather stem software. You know, I was just like building it. And, uh, you know, where, where did that energy come from? It, it was just like I'd, I'd be sleeping in the middle of the night and I'd wake up and, oh, I've got to go. There's like something pulling me to the computer. Um, and then sometimes it just goes away. Um, so that's, um, you know, something that uh, is, is very curious to me, and I'm sure everyone deals with that uh, as far as, you know, what, what brings you passion in the first place, and how do you keep it? Okay. Thank you. Other questions from the, the group, anyone? I've got uh, almost five till, and I know our folks, oh, we got one, one here, okay. 
Hi, thanks, Hi. great speech. Thank um, you. When you talk about the LMS that K through 12 is using, are there any trends that you can see evolving, like things that are being asked for, but there isn't anything that exists like that right now? Well, um, on, a, on a more general level, uh, I think as far as trends, I think that the future of innovation in online learning is more about assimilation than invention. In other words, I, I think what you're saying is no one is going to build one single system that does everything. I think the best system are going to be those things that are able to assimilate all these different things from all these different creative producers. So um, th that, that is what I think you're, you're seeing. The, the biggest trend is the demand for an LMS that is more capable and more savvy of incorporating more disaggregated components. So what company builds the best chemistry curriculum? How does that assimilate into the LMS? What company builds the best foreign language curriculum? Does that make sense? That, that's, my, that's my viewpoint anyway. Very good question. I, I, I'd like to, you know, I guess the rest of the time will be for questions. Yes, I, I think we're going to probably have to draw things to a close a little bit. So okay. I just want to, before people have to start to leave, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Ed, for was... taking the time being with us today and sharing with us your, pass and, your passion and your energy because it comes out in the way you talk and the way you share your stories. And I, for one, am looking forward to seeing what you're going to do next. Because uh, well, my sense is it's not going to stop here. But thank you, well, Ed. Please join me. Thank in... you so much. Thanks for the opportunity.